Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. This is episode number 705. My name is Camden Busey. I'm in Grays Lake, Illinois, and I have with me today some of our regulars. Uh, we're back with another Van Til group, the third one by my count. We have Dr. Lane Tipton, who's a pastor of Trinity OPC in Easton, PA, and serves as a fellow here of Biblical and Systematic Theology. Welcome back, Lane. It's so good to have you with us. Camden, it's great to be here, but I'm especially happy to be here for Van Til Group. Oh, yeah. We also have with us uh, Dr. Carlton Wind, who serves as a pastor down at Westminster PCA in Atlanta, Georgia. It's getting hot, no doubt. Uh, welcome back, Carlton. It's good to see you today. It's not as hot as the hot wings you guys ate, <laughs> and I'm glad I missed out on those, but it's so good to be with you. <laughs> you got it. Yeah, Carlton's referring to a special episode. We didn't release it as a podcast or anything, but if you're into uh, hot wings or theology, or especially the combination of the two, then uh, Lane and I did a spoof, kind of an homage to uh, Hot Ones, which is a an interview show on YouTube where they eat hot wings and ask questions in between. So we did one of those, and the link to that's on, on the website, as well as at youtube.com slash reformed forum. So you don't want to join us for this, maybe for a, a part due, Carlton? Brother, I would not make it past the first <laughs> bottle. Maybe the second, but then I would have to leave. But uh, it was it was a great well, my, episode. My uh, I have three boys, such as yourself, but uh, you know, four, seven, and nine, and they all three have had up to number six on that on that list. And five and six are getting a little spicy for them, but they can handle it. But uh, the the young, the lower ones, you'd be surprised. They're pleasant. But once you get into seven, then once you start talking upper register in that episode, that's that's the real deal. So anyway, <laughs> speaking of the real deal, we're talking Van Til's The Defense of the Faith today. Uh, much like our Voss group, we like to walk through some classic works in uh, recent Reformed history and uh, to work page by page through the sections, explaining them, uh, using them as uh, conversation starters and trying to apply them even maybe to contemporary issues in uh, the Reformed Church. And uh, today we're going to be coming to pages 32 and 33, at least in the first edition, pages 37 through 39 in the fourth edition, to discuss Christology. In the first chapter here, Van Til is going through Christian theology. We've discussed uh, the doctrine of God, and now we're coming, and the doctrine of man, and now we're coming to the doctrine of Christ, which is bringing the two together in many ways. And uh, it's a wonderful section. Uh, we're going to get into that and, and uh, draw some connections and connect the dots, so to speak, on a whole host of issues. But it all comes back to the very basic question that uh, Van Til is addressing, of course, man's relation to God, what that means uh, before and after the fall into sin, and uh, particularly as we develop, uh, or as Van Til develops this case throughout the entire book, its apologetic significance and import for all of those things. So necessarily, we have to get into some very basics of Christian doctrine. And uh, speaking of Christology, we can certainly see in the history of the church ways in which this has gone sideways <laughs> or upside down. <laughs> so it's always good to come back to the basics of uh, Christian ecumenical teaching and specifically understand uh, the doctrine of Christ as it's uh, summarized in the, the Westminster Standards, which is what Van Til does. Uh, before we get into some of that and uh, open things up and get back to our conversation on this point, we know it's been some months and before or since we've had the last Van Til group, but I do want to remind people to head on over to reformedforum.org, and there's a lot going on. Uh, we have uh, publications coming, a second printing of uh, the, the Voss bio by Danny Olinger. Fun stuff going on there. We're in the works of trying to get that uh, translated into Korean and Chinese uh, with some other uh, publishers overseas that are working on that front. So uh, exciting times there, as well as uh, Lane's book, uh, Foundations of Covenant Theology, which is coming out, should be out, should be available by the time this episode airs. Uh, so head on over to reformedforum.org uh, for ways in which you can get uh, paperback copies of that book and uh, e-copies if, uh, if that's what you prefer. But if you want to know what's going on in terms of our conferences, in terms of our publications, or if you'd like to get a copy of our email newsletter or our print newsletter mailed to your, your physical address, uh, yes, we do that still, then you can uh, subscribe at reformedforum.org slash newsletter. Oh, that's a great way to stay in touch with, with what we're up to, and we're always trying to keep people updated about the big events. We don't send a ton of email. We don't bomb you with 
insignificant things, but we try to keep you up to date in terms of what's going on here at Reformed Forum. So Carlton, let's uh, fire off. I'll, I'll pass things off to you maybe to get us started and situated here with the doctrine of Christ. And uh, I don't know, I was refreshed uh, by reading even just these two pages in the first edition as to how basic this is, but always reminded uh, of the significance and the profundity of ecumenical Orthodox Christology and reminded of the fact, at least in my studies on Ron, or no doubt you've had similar experience in your doctoral studies on Panenberg and, and in teaching at the seminary, how often we go way off the rails. And it's not that people walk around saying, I'm an Apollinarian, I'm Nestorian, but the, the seeds of those errors come up everywhere over and over throughout history. And we need to be on guard for those things. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I love how you set up um, this chapter in the context of Van Til's unfolding of the basic structure of his thought. Since it's been a while since the three of us have been together, and by the way, I've missed being together, uh, maybe it's helpful just to remind the listener that Van Til wants to set forth a biblical method of defending the faith in this book. And he also wants to address a number of objections that have come from colleagues and Dutch theologians. Um, and in order to do that properly, he wants to unfold the confessional theology that lies at the core of his apologetic approach. And so the doctrine of Christ section on page 32 comes on the heels of his discussion first to the doctrine of God and then doctrine of man. And maybe to kick us off, it'd be helpful for me just to read the first paragraph of this section on page 32, because he says a number of things that I think helpfully situate this chapter theologically and redemptive historically, that's gonna provide some good fodder for, for our discussion. Uh, Van Til writes these words, when we have discussed the doctrine of God and the doctrine of man, we have the two points between which the knowledge transaction takes place. Yet, since sin has come into the world, World, we cannot see the whole picture of reality from the Christian point of view unless we see how God and man are brought together after their separation. Reconciliation is possible only if God brings about salvation for man and therewith reunion with himself. Christ came to bring man back to God. So right from the get-go, Van Til wants to talk about the doctrine of Christ in light of the unnatural intrusion of sin. And he wants to speak of the doctrine of Christ in light of the need for reconciliation and the supernatural work of God to bring that reconciliation to pass. So uh, before we talk about the, the, the need for the incarnation, given the fall and God's desire to be reconciled to sinners, I'd like to pose to you, Lane, uh, just open the door to thinking about the pre-fall order for just a little bit and the non-necessity of the incarnation prior to the fall. I think this is going to maybe clarify and remind listeners of some of the things we've said about God's relationship to the world and his covenant with Adam. Why, why Lane, is it so important uh, to hold to the non-necessity of the incarnation prior to the fall? Uh, well, Carlton, great to be back, by the way. Um, yeah. But uh, uh, excellent question. And uh, the way I'm so appreciative of the fact that you read that first paragraph, because the way Van Til speaks here, notice this, he isolates the doctrine of God and the doctrine of man and the knowledge transaction located there. That's Van Til, to use classical reformed language, saying, I am speaking of the pre-fall estate of innocency where Adam was formed as the image of God, placed under the covenant of works, and there, Sabbath rest, life beyond probation, was offered to him. And that life, the confession is very strong in this, that life beyond probation, having God as his blessedness and reward, Westminster Confession 7.1, was attainable entirely apart from incarnation. There's an integrity to that pre-fall relationship, that estate of innocency, which has as its telos the estate of glory. And Van Til is really explicit here that, the, that when we as Orthodox 
confessional federalists. In other words, when we as classical federalists talk about the incarnation and the need for it, note Van Til says, since sin has come into the world, we cannot see the whole picture of reality from the Christian point of view until we see how God and man are brought together, here's the key phrase, after their separation. And so just for the, the, the original uh, point that we want to make here, we need to say this, that the, the logic of the incarnation in classical Reformed federalism is that it is remedial and redemptive aimed at bringing together or reconciling God and man after their separation due to Adam's original sin. And we can expand this more. I don't want to do it all right now. But the point that Van Til is making then is this, that the incarnation is not necessary in order, A, for the original relation between God and man to obtain, it obtained by virtue of image of God, and it's not necessary, B, to perfect that relation prior to the fall, because if Adam had offered perfect and personal, exact and entire obedience to the covenant of words, he would have had God as his blessedness and reward, been confirmed in original righteousness, and entered into Sabbath rest without the need for the incarnation. And so while this looks really simple and straightforward, and it is, it has profound polemical implications. Lane, that's super helpful. Uh, thank you. Uh, listeners to the Reform Forum, Crisis Center, um, y'all's discussions about the God world relation will probably be able to connect the dots uh, that a deficient understanding of God's relation to the world can lead into certain understandings that 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 the incarnation is is necessary prior to the fall. We we can review some of that material. Uh, if you guys want to, I have a slightly different angle on that that's maybe a little closer to home, not addressing, say, Roman Catholicism or Bardian theology, which I do hope we get to. Um, but, but what about this? Okay, I think there, there, there are Christians in the church who, who, who read the scriptures and they say that the consummation of all things is so thoroughly Christ-centered and, and the hope of the Christian in the world is so centered on the glory of Jesus Christ in the flesh, revealing the fullness of God's glory in heaven, that it's almost inconceivable to them that the consummation of, of a covenant relation with God could ever be realized apart from the incarnation, apart from the Son taking on our humanity. So so dependent are we, I'm playing devil's advocate here, so, so small are we, uh, so in need of God to stoop down and to make himself known to us, uh, that, that it's almost inconceivable that the, that the highest blessing conceivable for man could be, could be won or realized apart from the God-man. So what, what, what do we say to Christians who are rightly centered on, focused on, champions of the, the, the Christ-centered character of our heavenly hope. Uh, when we're talking about the pre-fall order, and, and Lane, you seem to be wanting to give the Heisman to, uh, to the incarnation prior to the fall. What would you say to those Christians? Excellent question, Carlton. Um, I would want to say that there are wonderful instincts that are at work Anytime someone talks about the fullness of life that comes to the church by virtue of union with the incarnate and ascended, incarnate, crucified, and ascended Christ. But we've got to be very careful here. Uh, and here, here's one way to think about this. We cannot let, and this happens in neo-orthodoxy, it happens with Thomas Goodwin, uh, a, a Puritan theologian. Uh, who is not a Bardian, but this can lead in a bad direction. We cannot allow the superabounding fullness of the redemptive and the restorative eclipse the integrity of the pre-fall order and the well-meant offer of life beyond probation and life in the estate of glory for covenantal obedience apart from the incarnation. Let me explain and expound. 
the Westminster Confession of Faith in Westminster Confession 7.1 says something that really needs to be impressed deeply upon us, that in his voluntary act of condescension, what God offered Adam for his perfect, personal, exact, and entire obedience, this is critical, is God himself. God is Adam's blessedness and reward. There is nothing fuller, richer, or more, more robust than having God himself, the triune God, for inheritance. And the movement would be that the natural religious fellowship Adam had with God under covenant, which was mutable, would be confirmed in immutable righteousness and holiness and knowledge. He would pass beyond probation, enter into Sabbath rest, and God himself and all of his inexhaustible fullness would be Adam's blessedness and reward. The incarnation is not necessary at that point to add anything to what Adam would receive given that original covenant relation. But at the same time, the scripture teaches, and our confessional standards are quite clear, that the incarnation, and Van Til makes this point, is necessary as a redemptive and remedial means, not only to restore, but to bring to consummation what Adam lost in his original sin for himself and his posterity. And and the scriptures teach, and I think our confessional standards bear this out, Voss will certainly develop this, Dr. Gavin has developed this, that the intimacy of the hypostatic union and the fullness that Jesus Christ in his humanity as the Redeemer attains in his humiliation and exaltation, that intimacy and excellency transcends what Adam had and what Adam himself could have had. So there's this superabounding fullness that accrues to the redemptive and remedial that, that takes us beyond where Adam could have attained. But even in that context, what's the common factor? The common factor is that in both scenarios, pre-fall, post-fall, it is God himself in his fullness who is the reward of the believer in union with Christ. And so I think we need to hold those two things together as mutually contextualizing truths. And don't let the superbounding fullness of the redemptive diminish the well-meant offer and integrity of the pre-fall situation. And so it really is a question, I think, of trying to balance both of those truths without rationalistically distorting one in light of the other. So when you say beyond, um, that, that word can mean qualitatively better, or it can mean uh, different, right? And, and yeah. I, I think I'm hearing you say we ought to recognize the redemptive coloration of the covenant's consummation in Christ, that there's the stamp of the cross and the resurrection on the glory of heaven revealed to the church. Um, but that at the same time, that beyond ought not to be conceived as something higher or necessarily better than the infinitude of God as man's blessedness and reward had Adam obeyed. So that, um, so that if we find ourselves, here's maybe the practical point, if we find ourselves thinking, well, th what we have in Christ is so good that it, it's got to be better than what Adam could have earned, um, maybe that's an opportunity to remember the integrity of the natural religious fellowship that Adam enjoyed with God, the sufficiency of the covenantal offer um, by way of perfect personal obedience, and especially just in terms of our theology of God, I think it's helpful to remember the infinity of God, that it is God, God himself. And there's no higher blessing for man than to enjoy God forever that was offered to Adam by way of that pre-fall covenant. And, and if we find ourselves creeping the incarnation into the pre-fall order, um, I think it may 
indicate that we're harboring some kind of more basic distortion on some element of the pre-fall order. Do you think that that's helpful? I don't want to talk without Adam, without uh, Camden getting a chance to speak here, but I think that's immensely helpful, Carlton. It's a, it's not a qualitative distinction, but a modal distinction. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. And and um and so given the modal distinction, it's it it manifests facets of God's relation to us that would otherwise not be known apart from sin, his saving grace through blood-bought atonement, the glory of bodily resurrection from death, and the impress of that upon our experience in our relation to God enriches our relation to God in a modality that would not be known to Adam prior to the fall. But as you point out, and this is the counterbalancing point, the end in both instances is the self-contained fullness of the triune God, then which none greater can be con conceived or experienced. And so both of those points, as you so helpfully put it, Carlton, both of those points, I think, need to be put in place in order to avoid distortion on either side. I think at times people that want to affirm the necessity or the supremacy of the incarnation for the God-man relation. And, and if they're doing so not for metaphysical reasons, there's a whole school or tradition that would do so that, that God and man need to have some sort of metaphysical bridge or ontological bridge to bring them together in order for God to relate at the highest level, for man to relate at the highest level with God. If, if people aren't making that claim, but still seeking to hold on to some supremacy or, or uh, uh, a better mode through the incarnation, maybe like a Jonathan Edwards who held to a Felix Culpa, oh, happy fall kind of thing. I think implicitly, just on the street theology, they tend to think that, that the incarnation is the way that God becomes a person, <laughs> or the incarnation is the way that God becomes relatable. And there's some truth to that in the sense that he experiences and can sympathize with our weakness. But I think when we when we start to think of those passages and that modality you described, Lane, and then move that quickly to, therefore, I can have better communion with him because he sympathizes in this way by, by bearing our nature, then we start to, I think, discount the ultimate purpose of what God is doing anyway. And we start to, I think, uh, try to put too much weight or importance on on what the incarnation accomplishes. It's remedial and redemptive, and God can heighten us and glorify us into eschatological union and communion, and we would have that communion with the Son and the Spirit and the Father in the way that we will through the incarnation. So I, 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 I tend to think it's not necessarily intentional or theologically driven. It's just often we, as human beings— are thinking according to humanity <laughs> and and how could God relate to us or how could we really know him if he isn't one of us? Well, it's possible. Yeah. Uh, even though, praise be to God, that now we do have Christ and, and an incarnate Christ because we needed someone to die for us <laughs> and to be raised for our salvation. Yeah, that, that that's so good, Camden. I Not only ought we to look back to the pre-fall order and and make sure we have a biblical assessment of of man's face-to-face -face fellowship with God, his endowment with all the ethical agency and excellency that he needed to obey God in covenant and realize the end for which he was made. But we can also look forward from the incarnation to the cross and understand that the incarnation is inexorably annexed to the work of atonement. And that we don't have an incarnation uh, abstracted from the cross and the resurrection of Christ. The incarnation itself, even post-fall, does not save. It's the incarnate Christ who dies and rises who saves. And so I, 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 I tend to think that um, a pre-fall notion of the incarnation is not only a distortion of the pre-fall order, but it also entails some kind of abstract notion of the incarnation that severs it from the cross, which I think is also um, 
unhelpful. Carlton, um, that 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 point, I was thinking exactly along those lines. Um, and two thoughts came to mind. One, I remember reading years ago in Calvin, where he talked about the incarnation per se as weak and insufficient to redeem if separated from the cross and resurrection. And then secondly, the shorter catechism and larger catechism views the incarnation as a means, uh, as the alpha point of the estate of humiliation and a means to the end of the omega point of that estate, which is the suffering of the cross. And its efficacy is never divorced from the estate of humili from exaltation that follows. And so I, I do think that um, there's, there's a, a, almost a strange philosophical preoccupation in the minds of some to say the incarnation is the central concern. Then you're starting to think metaphysically and abstractly and philosophically, and you're no longer thinking in terms of the way the incarnation functions within the concrete contours of the two estates of Christ. Lane, when you were here in Atlanta for my installation, this is a little inside baseball for the listeners. We were hanging out in my kitchen, and I even hesitate to mention this, but but we were talking about old, uh, like 80s and 90s Christian, Christian songs, and I threw on... Uh, Michael W. Smith's Secret Ambition. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, the lyrics to that song are so profound uh, that, that, that Jesus had a secret ambition to give his life away. It wasn't, it wasn't a messianic secret, but it was an open ambition. But, but hey, there's some insight there, right? That, 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 he, that he had an ambition to die in coming as the incarnate one. So I just want to, I just want to, cast a wide net to all the listeners, even the Michael W. Smith listeners, as we're making this point. Well, I would like to cast my vote uh, <laughs> uh, and my interpretive vote. I'd play that Michael W. Smith song, but I don't think we can afford it. Um, for uh, Wayne Watson and Sandy Patty's Another Time and Another Place. Oh, as, oh. as a, uh, I need to listen to it again, but I, maybe I don't. But I would say, well, let's think of that at least. Let's let's do a listener response theory and recast it as a as a yearning for the deeper Protestant conception. Brother, brother, every Christmas my parents had a record player back in Houston, and we would throw on the record of Sandy Patty, "The Gift," and the <laughs> gift goes on. And I'm telling you, yeah. deeper Protestant conception, the gift goes on. <laughs> oh, I got called up to on stage with her uh, at a concert. I was a little kid. She had all the children come up to the stage, and my mom was so jealous. No way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's my claim to fame. Guys, I, I, I have taken this with way Sandy far Patty. field, but... Well, I'm just afraid another time in another place could give way to some kind of geschickte concession. <laughs> That's why we need to we need to some... lay claim to the interpretation here. Yeah, yeah, we got to do that. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, okay we got to be militant about that. My fault, guys. My fault. I, I took us oh, far field. Good excursus. Okay, well, ha having discussed the, the nature of the pre-fall order, Van Til says, to try to bring us back to Van Til, uh, that, that beginning of the second paragraph, Christ came to bring us back to God, second paragraph, to do this, he was and had to be truly God. And in my notes here, I'm just, this is a little hypothetical, but Lane, I want to get your take on this. Uh, you've been a champion of uh, Calvin's notion and Van Til following him of, of the autotheon character of the son, that he is God of himself in his divine identity. He is the son from the father by way of his personal subsistence, but, but he is autotheos per his essence. And uh, when, when, when Van Til says to, to, to bring us back to God, he was and had to be tr truly God. Okay, this is a little off the cuff here, but but could you say that this is like a redemptive rationale for autotheon personhood? Yes, I, I think it, it very much could be in Van Til's mind. And the reason I put it that way is that the, um, the language that he uses there on page 32 is that Christ was and remained even when he was in the manger in Bethlehem a divine person. Now, if you just pause there 
And if we were, uh, I won't read other texts, but if you were to look at his, the way he self-consciously in the survey of Christian epistemology, places in the intro to systematic theology, speaks of the son's person. The, the, the son is not given an essence that is donated to him by the father. The son has the essence of God of himself, his autotheos, and he does not subsist as anything else. He subsists as the entire undivided essence of God. And the processional relation where the father and son are distinguished from one another in the act of the processional act of generation uh, pinpoints the personal existence of the son who has his personal existence from the father yet has his essence of himself and as such is um, self-contained, immutable, impassable. With that in place, uh, Van Til is going to make every effort to underscore that the divine, and here's the key, and the human are at no point commingled with one another. The son does not subsist in contingent historical realities. The son subsists as the essence of God. And so whatever you're talking about with regard to his agency, whether it's his agency in creation or it's his agency in incarnation, he remains, to use uh, Van Til's parlance here of autotheist, he remains an autothean person, a person who, in the nature of the case, is not, um, if, if we could put it this way, is not himself undergoing, as a person, any kind of change, variation, loss, or gain. And he here we come to various I mean, one of the places we can come is is the various canonic theories where where there's some kind of modification to the deity of the son when he assumes human flesh. You, you, you know, maybe even our English translations of of Philippians two, verse seven, that he 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 emptied himself can lead people to think, well, here's here's the son in glory, and he just lays aside his deity like a like a coat. And he takes on the coat of humanity. Um, I think it's important for us to recognize that Philippians 2.7 is not saying any such thing. It's bringing into view the humiliation of Christ, the other oriented uh, uh, heart of Christ, if we can use that language, in the incarnation. And I remember listening to a sermon by John Murray where he, he translates that phrase, for a kenosin, that Christ made himself of no reputation that he uh, did not count the prerogatives of deity something to be exploited for his own benefit, but made himself of no reputation. And how in the context of Philippians 2, Paul wants to make the point that this is the attitude that is ours in fellowship with Christ. This is the attitude of Christians uh, or ought to be in the church toward one another. Uh, but in no way in the incarnation does the divine person of the son undergo any sort of modification um, Lane or Camden, can you can you relate this back to the God world relation that we talked about prior to the fall, the integrity uh, of the of the God world relation as it's expressed now in the incarnation and in the hypostatic union? What what are the lines that we need to draw very clearly as we think about this unique expression of of deity relating to 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 created um to created things when we talked earlier about the god world relation and we've talked about this a lot and so i don't want to be too repetitive but we've got to remember that the foundations of the god world relation have systematic implications in every topic and when we define the god world relation it's this in the new relation to creation the relation changes the creature in the relation changes but God, in his essence and the persons of the Godhead, God does not change. And in the relation of incarnation, when the Son takes to himself a true body and a reasonable soul, in the hypostatic union, in that relation, we can say that the incarnation doesn't abrogate 
doesn't undermine, doesn't change the logic of that new relation of creation, but expresses it. The sun remains living, active, immutable, and self-contained in the hypostatic union. The relation to that human nature changes. He takes to himself a true body and a reasonable soul. The human nature changes, uh, grows, develops. It traverses estates. But the person himself remains immutable. Why? Because he is a divine person. And I'm almost certain we haven't quoted this before. If we have, here it goes again. But um, Van Til would have in mind something along the lines of what um, Voss says in volume three, page 42 of his Reformed Dogmatics. Here's what he says. Uh, Van Til's favorite professor, in the Logos, a divine person, you find one who is immutable from eternity. If there can be but one person in the mediator and the divine person cannot be eradicated or changed, then it is self-evident that this one person is the divine person of the Logos. One can only maintain the immutability of God if one holds to the deity of the person in the mediator. And so the person does not change, but the person uh, who takes that human nature to himself, that relation changes, and the human nature in the relation changes. And so I think we can say that in the incarnation, you have a Christological expression of the logic of the new relation to creation. I think it's helpful for people just to, to know, because some people who might not be following would say, well, obviously now the Son of God is a God-man. Like, who denies that? So didn't he change? Well, it, we're speaking here not of being able to say new things about the Son. We're speaking here ontologically, metaphysically. The person of the Son does not change. Before or after the fall, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is God. That's in not the only thing, but it is what it means to be God. He's a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. That's that's a summary of the Christian doctrine contained here in uh, the Westminster Shorter Catechism question and answer four. Now, after assuming a human nature, now we can describe the Son, we can say things about him that are different, but where do we ascribe the change? It's in the relation and according to his human nature. Not his divine nature, not his divine person, and that, and you know, we we certainly reject notions that Christ assumed a human person <laughs> as an adoptionist heresy, or that he somehow gave up his divine personality in order to, to then have a human one, or that his being is somehow commingled with a human being uh, of any sort, or that he hollowed out. Uh, you know, there's there's any number of permutations of errors here, uh, but certainly we must and always maintain the immutability of the Son of God, and that applies not only to His divine nature, but also to His to the hypostasis, the divine person. So there is a change, but the change is in the relation, and change occurs according to the human nature. That, that really ought to be just basic theology. So Van Til's not doing anything weird or novel, or he's not, he's not blazing a trail. And this, I think that's helpful to underscore as well, that Van Til is just, at this point, explicating just basic Christian ecumenical doctrine that, that should be affirmed by any Christian, such that if you don't affirm these things, you're not just in error, you're not Christian. It's heretical. These aren't just matters of opinion within the Christian tradition. And Van Til is building this foundation here in order then to, to develop a Reformed apologetic. But that's... Camden, that, that's so spot on. Just a quick question, and tell me if I'm following you uh, here for our listeners. When we say that we can assert something new with reference to the Son, that he is now incarnate, crucified, and ascended, um, and that the relation is new, but the person himself has not changed. Wouldn't we, if we said, no, 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 the person has changed in the incarnation. He was once not incarnate. Now he is. So the person has changed. Wouldn't we be obligated 
to use identical logic about God the Creator and say, "Oh no, 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 God changed when He created because and, and people have once wasn't the, <laughs> exactly, exactly." So it, it's it, it's why I think we're we're I, th- I hope this helps our listeners because I don't know if we've done this as much as we should, but as goes the logic of God the Creator, so goes the logic of the Son incarnate. Right. That's very good. Um, this is this is great that we're talking about this. Uh, just yesterday, I was in a conversation with a pastor here in Atlanta about the incarnation, specifically about Jesus's knowledge of himself as the divine son of God. And I was um, discussing with this pastor a couple of comments by Voss and his Reformed Dogmatics that um, that, that Jesus' knowledge of himself as the divine son of God was not bare conjecture or, or speculation, uh, that Jesus did not need reinforcement. He did not uh, abandon his confidence, if we can even use that word, that he is the divine son of God when he hung on the cross and said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But it occurred to me in this discussion that that all of these questions about what what did Jesus believe about himself require uh, a very clear understanding of the divine personhood of of the son in its relation to the limited human mind of the incarnate Christ. And the great mystery to me is um, is is that the the divine person impersonalizes the human nature in such a way, and that's my special Murray-like phrase that tells you mystery is coming in such a way that the limited developing and changing character of Christ's mind is not obliterated or violated, but it does subsist in the divine person whose mind is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. And how you know, how to rationalize this, it's just impossible. Um, We must say that Jesus knew himself to be the son of God, even in the flesh as a man. He knew when he spoke, I speak now. He knew that he was speaking as the divine son of God, even as he could be surprised and learn things according to his human nature. So these questions of the self-conception of the son require uh, a, a deep theology of of the incarnation that begins, as Van Til said, um, by prioritizing um, theologically and, and temporally, if we can use that analogical term, uh, the ontological Trinity. That is so useful, Carlton, and and it's it's fascinating to me, and I think it's instructive for us all that at the bottom of page thirty two, and this is going right where you're going, Carlton. I I, I think make. Let, let me know if I'm, I'm missing something, but he says it will be noted at this point that this view of the incarnation is in full accord with the doctrine of God as set forth above. And just incidentally, as an aside, in the IST pages 211, he, he makes explicit that Dorner, whom we've mentioned before, argues that God actually changed when he created the world, and he actually changed when he became incarnate. And that's consistent. Uh, that your doctrine of God and the new relation of creation to your doctrine of the incarnation and the hypostatic union, and you say God's changing in both cases. But Van Til's saying, well, that's actually not the case. Uh, it's wrong to say that. Why? Because we're going to r- express our theology of the incarnation in a manner that entirely with that first sentence, the doctrine of God and the doctrine of man in relation to one another in that new relation of creation under covenant. We should probably, before we wrap up, we should probably say something about the offices of Christ. Uh, Van Til on page 33 uh, says he needs to give a brief statement about the person of Christ and his offices. He is true prophet, priest, and king. And here's, here's maybe one way to go about it. Um, when Van Til discusses the fall, okay, what do you think about this? He says that man became totally depraved in every dimension of his being, and that specifically he set before himself the ideal of comprehensive knowledge. 
And he became an idolater in every aspect of his life on earth and his relation toward God. Um, I find it fascinating, and this hit me reading this section, that when Van Til talks about Christ as prophet, um, instead of ascending into a comprehensive knowledge through Christ's humanity, um, Christ as prophet makes man realize, as Van Til puts it, that he is a creature of God and that he cannot seek for himself comprehensive knowledge. So the, 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 the prophetic office of the mediator is, is designed in part to counter the very idolatrous ambition of fallen man to achieve comprehensive knowledge apart from the revelation of God. And then, and then the priesthood of Christ, if I can push it just a little bit further, Van Til draws out the fact that our knowledge of God is, is not just cognitive, but ethical in the sense that we know God um, and, and love God in, in one and the same act. And we need Christ as priest uh, to give us that ethical renewal, dying for our ethical depravity regarding our knowledge of God. And then as king, uh, we need him to subdue us, that we might know him and love him as ones who are subjects to him as our king. So just the wonderful way that Van Til organically unfolds these three offices of Christ, prophet, priest, and king, in relation to the fall of man and our desperate need for a perfect mediator. Yeah, I, th I think this is really in the, the confluence of two huge themes that we're going to encounter throughout this entire book and that you, we encounter throughout all of Van Til's writings. Obviously, covenant, so the God-man relation, and that is uh, affected. Our understanding of that is, uh, is highly determined by the fall into sin. But then the ethical uh, nature of knowledge that is inescapable. Knowledge is ethical. Thinking is an ethical act and therefore also determined and influenced by our relation to God through covenant, whether we're thinking through Adam, fallen Adam in the covenant of works, or we're thinking with renewed minds and hopefully uh, through sanctification and obedience through Christ, the second and last Adam. So that emphasis, it might be missed by people who are not as familiar with, with Van Til, but his, his reference there, particularly on, on priest, as you point out, is is a little foretaste of a world of study uh, that, that many people don't think because a lot of folks, uh, Gordon Clark, other interlocutors that Van Til has, are not operating with the assumption that knowledge is ethical. Now, certainly they would acknowledge ethical aspects to it, but Van Til affirms that certainly you might have a theoretically correct or on the surface of it uh, accurate statement but that's not knowledge in the biblical sense. That to know God and to know about him is not merely to have facts, in much the same way that faith involves knowledge, but also assent to that knowledge, and also fiducia, trust. In the same way here, biblical knowledge, the knowledge we're after, the knowledge we're defending, <laughs> the epistemology we're going to be explicating and advancing through Van Til is not just bare facts. Those don't exist. But truth and, and knowledge as it relates to God through Christ, namely, as, as, as it's covenantal. So I just, you know, there's a lot to be said. We won't say it all now, but uh, I just love that portion. I love how you describe it, Carlton. And, and uh, I anticipate discussing this many, many more times over the next, you know, many, many dozens, hundreds of lessons, <laughs> thousands of lessons. <laughs> Yeah, let me, let me just add, we're not saying that we're just brains on a stick and need a priest to die for our thinking. Uh, the kind of knowledge we're talking about is knowledge that carries with it, as you said, that the honoring and loving of God. We are whole beings who need the priestly work of Christ to redeem us from every aspect of our fallen condition. Yeah. But, but, but Jesus himself said that eternal life is, is knowing the true and living God in Christ whom he sent. So we have that full Lord covenantal knowledge in view. Amen. Amen. And it's not enough in apologetics. We're, we're after a, a maximalist version of defending the faith here. Defensively Amen. against warding off all, 
all uh, attacks against the gospel and against our Lord, but also offensively, not being an offense, you know, adding offense to the gospel, which is already offensive to fallen man, but going on the attack, destroying all strongholds, every thought, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ and destroy those strongholds that would be built up against the kingdom of God. But in doing that, we're not merely trying to lay out rational arguments, even if that were possible, to say, here are the bare facts, here's our defense. But the goal of apologetics is not to get someone to think one way or the other, but to disciple. It's a great commission understanding to go forth and, and to inculcate and cultivate by, by uh, obedience to Christ and by deference to the Spirit and His work, but to, to cultivate a true knowledge as the Bible describes it. Psalms, Proverbs, you name all the, all the, all the wisdom literature— Speaking of knowledge, it's not datum or data, factoids. It's, it's a whole life awareness, knowledge, communion, and communion with God and seeking to live in a way that, that honors him. To love him is to obey his commandments. To know him is not just to know about him or to know what he claims about himself, but to follow after him in obedience. That's that's what Van Til's about. That if we don't, you know, if we miss that point, then let's just scrap the book. I mean, that's what that's what we're after here. Ultimately, a great commissional activity of of going forth and making disciples. Smash the stereotype, brother. That's wonderful. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Beautiful. It's beautiful. Well, it's always fun to to discuss these things, and uh, we'll pick back up, Lord willing, next time. Hopefully, that'll be next month or, or soon thereafter. Uh, right around page 33 in the first edition, looks like this, at least my copy does. You got the fourth edition as well. That can work. Uh, contents the same. Yes. Lane's got it also. So they're harder to find, uh, but they're, you might have the Logos edition, whatnot, uh, electronic, however you find it. We try to go off the headings here. So we're into the doctrine of salvation next time. And uh, we'll be picking that up. So if you got any comments or questions, uh, you can write in to mail at reformedforum.org. You can hit us up on Twitter, Facebook. Uh, Facebook, you know, we, we get that, but uh, don't always stay up to date there. But um, uh, we love to, to interact. We love to help you understand Van Til better insofar as he, he leads us as one who is faithful to the Lord and leads us to understand and follow after Christ in a, in a faithful way. So there's a lot going on. And again, check out reformedforum.org for information about new publications, deals on on those books, bulk copies, all sorts of cool stuff going on. I do want to thank everybody for listening, and we hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.